because we've got a campaign um, against PBS who is censoring a movie about how China took the last 100 million people out of poverty after it took another 700 million people out of poverty. And so we know we're not getting the truth. We know we live in a sea of propaganda. We know that um, the, goal, the tools of war are, it's a, it hasn't changed you know, since the end of World War II. It's othering, it's demonizing, it's you know making someone else a, an enemy, um, which then allows you to like use weapons and what I say is murder people because if they're dying, they're being murdered. There, there, there is no excuse for war. So here we are to be human together, to be humanized. Um, and so this is really a conversation. I'm gonna start with a lot of questions I have for Tings and then invite you as I'm asking questions and as you're thinking to put your questions in um, the chat, we will bring them into the, and give them to me and I'll be able to ask them later. So feel free, what am I not asking? What, are, what, is, what, what is one answer from Tings provoking another question in you? So we'll talk for about 30 minutes and then we will bring me your questions. We are, you know, the drums, Ukraine took up a bunch of time and and was we were all in the fog of war with Ukraine. And now we're hearing the drums of war in Washington again for China. It's been a busy week. Uh, we disrupted uh, an event this week and maybe Wei can put in the tweet about that if anybody in the chat, if anybody wants to check that out. We disrupted an event which was literally war games on uh, Taiwan, really disgusting. Um, conversation that got disrupted by the Code Pink team, and then um, an, a vote in Congress where we were able to get actually more people in Congress to say no to a Cold War on China than we are able to get members of Congress to say, please call for a diplomacy, Biden, with Ukraine. So that's a little bit of good news, but you know, as we say, it's easier to stop a war than to uh, it's easier to stop a war from starting than to stop a war which has already started. And that kind of proof is in the pudding with who we could get on board with both of these issues. Um, so now that everybody's got a chance to join, I wanna introduce you yet again to Tings and some of you for the first time. Tings Chalk is part of the Dongsheng News team and um, Wei is going to share with you links because if you haven't subscribed to Dongqing News, do now because you'll get to hear things every week. I think it's Friday or Saturday. Um, uh, take you through two minutes of just news from inside China, which we are denied. And I, um, I love her voice and I love listening to her every week. And like what the diet of two weeks of actual real news on China is a good thing to have in our psyches as, as part of our diet so that we become relational with China. And Tings is also a researcher, artist, and cultural coordinator at Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. She's been working with movements globally in Africa and Latin America before moving to China three years ago. She's joined us a couple of times in the last few years where we've asked her to share a little bit of her life, what she's learning, and we're thrilled that she's come back um, and also that she gets up early uh, to kind of make it work with our schedule here. Tings, what time is it in China? It's 9 a.m., so it's very reasonable. <laughs> so, um, but we've been on, so she had to get up early. So um, we're happy that you got up early to be with us. Thank you so much for joining us again. Um, so you've been living in China almost three years. And I guess let's just start out. Oh, I also want to say that Tings just did a piece on COVID um, because there were so many questions on COVID and um, Wei will post that in the chat also. So we're probably not going to cover a lot there because she's already written so much on it. Um, but, you know, we're going to touch a little bit on these last three years because they are the COVID three years. Um, what um, have you learned in the last three years? Like, what would you say, you know, given the entering China and where you are now, 
what would you say some of the highlights of what you learned are? Mm, big question, but first of all, I just want to say thanks, Jody, and the whole Code Pink team for having me again. I think it's amazing you continue to fight and create these spaces to dialogue and always on the front lines, you know, always following your work and trying to see what disruption you're up to. So this is great. Always happy to be here. I think these three years, it's, you know, it's so much to, so much learning, so much learning, so much unlearning at the same time, right? I mean, just a little bit of background of myself, you know, I'm from Hong Kong and, and grew up in the West in Canada and, and spent a lot of my adult years back in the global South and which finally brought me back here for work and study. But even though I've always had a chance to visit the mainland, I still have family um, in Guangdong. Uh, you know, we frequently visited my grandfather's village or family um, there, but I never lived in mainland China, you know? And now I'm currently in Beijing. The last time I had been here, first and last time, was 17 years ago. And I think for many of us, whether we're Chinese uh, in other parts of China, let's say not in mainland, or in the diaspora, or just people who have never lived here, I think we have a lot of, I don't know, our perceptions of China can be kind of stuck in the past. They're sort of frozen in a different era, don't have an updated view. And that's maybe part of the reasons why some of these narratives can be um, taken advantage of in the media, particularly Western mainstream media. So I think it was a process of unlearning and really seeing a society that's quite dynamic, um, that has advanced in so many ways. I mean, I know sometimes there's a kind of interest in the technological, scientific, or digital developments, which is very important in daily life. But it's also the social aspects, um, sort of the 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 lifting up um, of hundreds of millions of people into a new middle class, um, the eradication of extreme poverty, and you feel that when you live uh, here. And I think that's the sort of social side of the economic growth that we don't get to see in the media. And I would think that was a big part. And it took it takes me a long time to also convince my own family, whether they're in Canada or Hong Kong or Macau, um, that, that China has changed significantly than the views we have from, let's say, I don't know, maybe stuck in the Cultural Revolution era or stuck in the early days of the opening up reform uh, or even stuck 15 years ago. It's just a very fast and changing society. You know, like I'm looking out my window right now, it's a bright blue sky in Beijing. That seems inconceivable. Even 10 years ago, the, you know, the last months I've been here, almost every day has been a bright blue sky. And I would have thought that was impossible thinking about the pollution that was in the early 2000s. So that's just a concrete example of, of just living and walking and breathing air here. It's still a long way to go, but uh, uh, it's impressive how much things can change in a short amount of time. Cool. Um, I didn't note in introducing you that you you last time we talked to you you were in Shanghai, but you've moved to Beijing to go to school, um, correct? And maybe give us a little bit of like what's that like to go to school in China? I think you went to school in Canada before, and um, what moved you to to go to to school? Yeah, um, yeah. So I'm, I'm I started my PhD this fall. Um, at Tsinghua University. Uh, I'll say it's been a long time since I've been in university. <laughs> so whether or not it's in China or elsewhere, you're right, I did my, my uh, both my undergrad and my master's in Canada, but that was a long time ago. So I've been adjusting the last few months, remembering all those things like selecting courses and, you know, those online platforms of how to submit your papers and et cetera. So it's been, it's been great. Um, uh, and I'm, you know, balancing the work plus study, um, which is interesting as well. I would say there's a lot of um, maybe two things that struck me um, that are quite different than studying in the West, let's say. Um, one is the experience of the canteens. Um, here, the canteens, cafeterias are all heavily subsidized. So um, I often like to take pictures and send to my friends to say, oh, I, you know, this would be equivalent of like 60 cents for a meal or something like that. And um, it's just such a vibrant place because you, it's basically kind of a big food court where um, you can just pick little plates of food 
from all parts of China. And so it depends on you know what day you feel like you want to have some Sichuanese food, some Cantonese food or whatnot. Um, and it's just this really collective experience. It's very different than I think the time I spent in Canada where I just felt like I was, you know, um, uh, like, the 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 the, the Coca Cola stands or you know the kind of I don't remember the, the distributors but it was just like unhealthy food not um, extremely expensive not subsidized um, and anyway so it's very different experience and also the experience of just eating collectively it's it's uh, quite nice um, another thing is I guess there is a different kind of culture of um, um, respect for professors I would say here. Um, so for one example, it is uh, it is an environment where there's a lot less sort of group discussions. It is something more like, okay, you go and listen to the lectures and that's something I'm getting used to as well. Um, but it's a super friendly environment. I think the first few days I was remembering, you know, many, many, many years ago when I did my undergraduate degree, um, you know, the kind of culture around drinking, culture of partying, culture, it's quite different here. Here it's, there's a lot of, um, uh, a different kind of social life that's not centered around alcohol um, for students. So that was also refreshing. There's just a lot more like the first few days, there was just so much like physical activity and games that people were playing all throughout the university. Um, I didn't really play, but I, I, I absorbed it all. And that was quite interesting to see as well. Oh, cool. That's fun. To, uh, it's, plus, it's a beautiful campus. I've seen your photos. It looks quite beautiful. Yeah, amazing. But that's true around, you know, that's true in Shanghai and Beijing, just the beauty and the parks and the greenery is always so staggering that, you know, in yeah. such a big city. And everyone bikes. Um, so that's one thing you really have to get used to. Like if you, I always biked in cities. I always, you know, use that as my transportation, but um, here's real biking, you know, when you have to enter the sort of rush hour of hundreds and hundreds of bikes on the campus. <laughs> Well, I want to go back to COVID. So um, you were living in Shanghai when the first kind of quarantine shutdown hit. What was that, like a year ago? Um, yeah, in May, around there. May of, of not this year. Of, of last year, yeah. yeah. Year. So maybe like seven months ago. Mm -hmm. Um, what was it like, you know, that um, you'd been free, you know, the whole world was suffering from COVID and China hadn't really been suffering from it um, once it'd been eradicated in the very beginning. Um, and then it hit. What was that like? You were living in Shanghai, the first city to be locked down, correct? Well, actually, I think one of the things is, you know, three years, a lot of things happened. And I think right now in the recent months, especially in the Western media, it's kind of quite um, sensationalist about what has been happening is there's a kind of amnesia. I think short-term memory, you know, a short-term memory society, short-termism is how we uh, see the world, is that looking back um, for after the Wuhan period, which was controlled in about 73 days, um, in that city, and that was a scary time, you know, because it was a virus that no one knew anything about. There were no vaccines and the city was shut down and the country mobilized its resources, sent tens of thousands of doctors and, and, and try to save lives. And that was the most important thing in that moment. But for the most, the vast majority of the last three years, I would say most of us lived a pretty normal life, you know, because especially the first trains, strains, the most deadly ones were contained pretty effectively by the zero COVID policy. So I think one of the things, and you mentioned the article, and I think shared it in the group here that I wrote was just this, I think I felt the need to be able to defend not all the kind of the bad and the ugly and the mistakes of that any government will make in terms of in front, uh, confronting such a difficult and like historic pandemic, but actually just remembering, it feels like there's that amnesia that for a long time, most of us were not living in lockdown. Uh, okay, you know, we wear masks in public spaces, that's not because we're like fearful of the government, but it's just because we're a collective culture and we wanna protect people around us as much as we wanna protect ourselves. That's just a normal thing. That's not even an issue. Um, 
or that we, maybe we had to take a PCR test before you travel from one city to the next. And there were sort of some um, pop-ups of, of cases that were controlled pretty quickly, sometimes with lockdown measures, sometimes with mass testing, sometimes with other measures because China was testing how to deal with this virus uh, in cities of different scales. You know, Shanghai is a place of almost 25 million people. It's massive. So I wanna just kind of at least bring that back to the present to remind us that that was the, the reality for most Chinese people for most of the last three years. Um, Shanghai was tough. You know, I spent the entire two months that the city was in lockdown in lockdown. Um, I think there were, including the government itself, made its own criticisms of some of the um, lack of preparations or um, sort of slowness to act. You know, initially they wanted to sort of just close some areas and not the whole city and that, you know, um, the virus moved around. And I think it was also a learning about the new strains of virus, especially Omicron, are extremely transmissible. You know, the old measures that worked quite well with even Delta or the previous variant um, wasn't as effective for something that transmits that fast. That was also at the same time less deadly. So this is also kind of a testing ground, the Shanghai moment, as much as it was tough for, for all of us, it was a learning moment for now, this period of transition to um, a more relaxed uh, uh, COVID policy. Um, and it's learning from that. One thing I did learn, even though I spent two months in my house, which on the good side is I, after you know initial period of figuring out how to buy food, and that was sorted out pretty quickly, there's a lot of neighborliness. And I think you'll like this because I know Code Pink is very um, interested in building a local peace economy. I think in some ways, many of us learned that, uh, that kind of local level solidarity. Of course, the government was there and sent boxes of food when they could, but it wasn't everything that you needed. So a lot of the community groups um, and just neighbors got together, formed WeChat groups. WeChat is our, our social media. It's kind of like WhatsApp. Formed groups to bulk buy, uh, to kind of check in on each other, especially the elderly who are the most vulnerable, uh, you know, um, exchange food. You know, I knew a neighbor on the third floor that had a baby and, you know, did she have enough milk, that kind of thing. So a lot of people experience that uh, neighborliness uh, in a city so big, it's sometimes hard to recover that. So that is also, I think, I think a silver lining of that experience. So um, during that period of time before the lockdown, you got to travel a lot around China and um, you talked about how large uh, Shanghai is. I think one of the things I think that's also confusing to the US is there were like all of China never was in lockdown. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Maybe, maybe 200 million people were locked down in a I actually don't know the numbers, but maybe in terms of major cities, about 10 cities over the last three years have experienced a kind of lockdown um, and they vary in length. You know, for example, Guangzhou uh, was um, very, oh yeah, Guangzhou was pretty fast. Uh, they did a lockdown about seven to 10 days around the time that uh, Shanghai was in lockdown, but that was about two months. So it this says a lot about local implementation and just different measures and effectiveness and so it's not all one blanket thing, but on the whole, I mean, China's massive country, 10 cities in a country so big is not that much. So probably more. about a billion people weren't in lockdown. Yeah, least. or if they were uh, in terms of like experience some isolation it would be in short periods of time, you know, oh, if they got COVID or if they, you know, were near someone with, um, you know, with COVID or high risk of being, uh, having COVID, that kind of thing. But it was not the vast majority of the experience for most of the, last three years. So could you tell us, like you, you did get to travel and you talked about getting the test before you got on a plane or whatever. And so I have a bunch of travel questions, like where did you get to go? Um, what What's travel like? The planes, the fast trains, the subway, there's so many interesting, you know, ways to get around. Um, and um, also, I think people don't understand the city tier thing. If there, you could explain the first, second, third tier rural kind of, that's a, a yeah. big thing in a question, but like, what's it like to travel and where are they, where did you go? Sure. No, I mean, I would have loved to travel more than I actually did. That's not because of COVID, that's just because of work and time. Um, but I did have a chance to go uh, have a couple of trips that for me were very meaningful. 
Um, of course, both in terms of the tiering, uh, responding to your question, is that China has four tier one cities. Uh, so Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, both of those are in the south, um, in Guangdong province where I'm from. Um, but uh, these are the mega cities. And then we tier down for, for different scales. And it's not just the size of population, but it's like infrastructure, you know, kind of different facilities. There's a whole set of metrics of how a city is classed that way. And, and it's a way to also help implement policy. That being said, you know, um, I, one experience I had was going to, I think it's a tier three or four city in Guizhou. And I remember talking to a friend who's from Beijing. So she's used to always living in a big city. And she's like, oh, yeah, it's it's like a, it's a small town, you know, it's a very small tier three, four city. And it's a city of four million people, you know, so <laughs> in any other context, it'd be a massive city. You know, in the city I lived in, um, in Toronto, I think it's just about five million. So <laughs> that's the biggest city in Canada. And so anyways, that gives it perspective of how, what scale is, but that would be a, a lower tiered city. Um, so very much still up and coming in one of the poorest regions, uh, poorest provinces. And that was a great experience because I went with um, some researchers of Tricontinental, uh, which you mentioned, to do a study to go and, and visit some of the places of the uh, poverty alleviation campaign. Uh, Guizhou was one of the provinces that was a focus of this campaign. Uh, trying to look at basically um, the poor in the rural areas of the regions that had not been developed as quickly as and, and prioritized for development, like in the Eastern part in places like Shanghai and, and, um, uh, and, and Beijing, for example. So that being said, it was amazing experience going from the kind of city to the countryside, um, um, getting to talk to, uh, you know, women, uh, youth, elders, um, you know, party members, uh, uh, people who work in businesses who had been also sent by the businesses to live and work with families who are uh, in, were in poverty and kind of over the years uh, uh, create a plan somehow collectively um, to exit extreme poverty. And it was an incredible experience, to, especially when you do the travel at that point was living from Shanghai to get to the countryside to understand uh, how life in the countryside has really improved. You know, I remember talking to a woman uh, and she became in the process of this lifting herself out of poverty. She ended up joining the party and becoming a local leader. As she was said that in the countryside, she used to have to walk at least two hours a day to take her kid to school uh, there and back. Uh, and so that would be four or five hours a day. Now, you know, she lives in a community where there is health clinics, there's a school, um, there's daycare. Uh, she says, I live, I lived, I live upstairs and I work downstairs because she's now a local um uh local uh, party official um that what basically is there to serve, you know, hundreds of families and knocks on the doors of all these families and helping them because she felt like she was really helped in this process. And her kid is, you know, two minute walk from, from her school. So these kinds of improvements are very concrete and material in people's lives. It uh, means that every day she has four or five extra hours to do what she actually really wants to be doing, which is contributing to her community. I think that's just one example of millions and millions I could, I could go on about. Um, and another trip I did, which was really meaningful, me, meaningful for me personally, is I got to go back to my grandfather, my, my maternal grandfather's village. Uh, and it's been maybe almost 10, 12 years that I hadn't been. And since my grandfather had gone quite old, he hadn't had a chance to go back. So I really wanted to do that for him at the time he was in the hospital. Uh, he actually just passed away a few months ago. But I was really happy to be able to go back to the village that he left when he was 12, you know, during wartime, during Japanese occupation, and he left on his own to go to Macau and where he spent the, most of his life. But, you know, it was great. I did a Zoom call on, on like the hilltop of a little memorial that he had built for his parents and all the villagers were there and remembering him and talking to him. And we all had a great time. And I also got to bring my partner and they were really excited because they had never seen a Brazilian before. So, and it was fun. And the night ended up with us at the karaoke, you know, um, with the, a lot of our, you know, relatives and villagers. It was great fun. <laughs> Well, that's beautiful. Um, so you have taken trains and planes in the subway. Anything you can tell us about how that's different than Canada, Brazil, Africa, you know, like the infrastructure of the of travel? 
Yeah. I mean, I'll use this example of going to the village because I've done that trip several times before and since I was a baby, you know, and it's incredible. Uh, and I was the one thing I consistently told my family members because they were shocked, especially those don't, who don't live there anymore, uh, was about the high speed train, uh, the high speed train that takes us to the nearest city, uh, which was so quick. And it was impossible almost for my grandfather to understand that, wow, his hometown has a high speed train um, because that journey used to be, you know, really slow roads. Then you have to take a boat and then you have to like find a local person to kind of take you over. Then there's bridges and dirt roads. It's like it was a day to get to the village. Now it was we like zip there uh, uh, with a with a high speed train. Uh, and then the roads were great. So my uncle picked me up and then we just drove straight to the, it was, it was fantastic to see. I mean, this is this, the improvements in the 10, 15, 20 years. And so high-speed trains are wonderful experiences. They're just, you know, if you like people watching, it's a wonderful place. It's also just, you know, there's Wi-Fi. there's, um, it's so, if anyone has any kind of motion sickness, you know, it's just like the smooth, fast ride. You get to see the countryside, you get to see the city. You don't have to worry about some of the messiness of flying. So um, it's, it's a very, I would say, dignified way of traveling. Cool, well, thank you. You talked about going karaoke and I'm just thinking like, you know, when you finish work, what, is, what do folks do for fun after work? Like, what do you do to get together um, as friends, as colleagues? Um, what's social life look like? Eating a lot. I feel like that is just still the center of culture, you know, especially here in Beijing. A big part is hot pot, hot pot culture. Obviously, hot pot is in a lot of places and there's a lot of rivalry, rivalry between cities of who has the best hot pot. You know, I'm going to think that Guangdong hot pot is the best. But anyways, I'm in Beijing now. So sharing food is a huge thing. Yeah. Um, um, and for those who haven't eaten hot pot before, I think it's wonderful. I think symbol of a collective way of eating you know basically you'll have a hot pot of boiling water not water like soup or, or anything and you get to cook different kinds of meats veggies seafood and eat together and make and mix with delicious sauces and and everyone shares from the pot cooks from the pot and and it's a great way to spend you know entire night um but i mean i just i think it's here especially in a big city i think it would be what you expect from from many big cities you know um, for a while, I was trying to take dance classes with a friend, but I think I, I kind of fell out of discipline with that because um, I just couldn't make it fit in my schedule. But that was quite fun. Uh, it was a kind of um, it was a salsa dancing cl uh, class. and It's quite hard for me. So that was fun. But I think it's just any kind of big city, nothing kind of unusual or different um, that you could imagine. Uh, but definitely food is the center of all social life. And then um, you mentioned the woman, you've mentioned women a couple of times. What's it like to be a woman in China? Is there anything you find different that's there? Yeah, I think there is something, I, for the first few months I was here, it's a quite profound experience or realization. And at first I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to put a name to it. Just, um, by, by the fact that, you know, in Shanghai, the streets are pretty safe for a woman to walk in. And right before this, I was I was living in Sao Paulo in Brazil. So compare big city to big city. Uh, and before that, I was in Johannesburg in South Africa. And then before that, I was in Toronto in Canada. So have a, good, a bit of that north, south big city experience. But I would say uh, between Shanghai and Beijing, I've never been in a place as a woman walking the streets, I can feel so safe. Um, and, and, and I think obviously one of the things is, you know, I'm Chinese. So, you know, is that one of the reasons like I, I blend in, even if I am not from these cities? I, and I talked to a lot of friends who are also from other places and, and they experience, you know, this, a very similar experience. Um, you know, I, I can go out and late at night or feel like, oh, I went out and went to a bar and come home on my own and generally feel very safe. And I didn't know how much mental energy that we as women, ha I mean, it's not that I don't want to paint this as a kind of place we've, where we've gotten rid of patriarchy and there's no violence against women or nothing. I don't want to do that, but just the mental energy of um, not having to always watch my back, uh, always sort of be aware, oh, where's my cell phone? Uh, you know, I can't have it in my hand. Um, just 
so much mental energy is spent. And I, that's the thing I couldn't understand when I first moved here. I actually had more mental space and emotional space to think about other things and do other things um, with the energy. And that was something you can't quantify, you know, uh, you just feel it. And as, so I've had this conversation with so many women from different places that say that, say that exact same thing. And, and of course, like that isn't just, an accident, you know? Um, yes, you know, I was making a joke that, you know, there's, I don't think there's any place in the world where we managed to smash patriarchy yet. And that's unfortunate. And we're still working on it. And we're not giving up. But there were huge gains made in the early socialist period, you know, like in terms of education, the social aspects, or, or, you know, kind of flipping around the whole idea of marriage and, and women in the workplace and participation in political life. Um, so that, that, is present and think in, in terms of when, when we say, oh, Mao said women uh, lift up half the sky, you know, that that became a value. But of course we know that, you know, patriarchal views, traditional view, views, culture, it that takes a long time to change. This is a millennial culture that um, takes a long time to change. Uh, and of course, economics, the political landscape has also changed really rapidly, especially in the last decades. You know, we're not in a time of the family planning of one child policy anymore, but doesn't mean that, you know, young women are now eager and jumping to want to get married or have a child or feel like um, motherhood and wifehood like is necessary to complete herself. So there's all sorts of questions now about being a woman, I think, in, in China um, that's much more nuanced uh, than one gets to read in the Western media. Um, and there's just such a much more diverse kind of set of questions and um, choices in life that were never afforded in, in literally 5,000 years of history for, for women here um, or anywhere in the world, really. So, yeah, I think those are some reflections and, and many of them. Um, and I'm really glad to be able to also have a group of, of friends and women here from different parts, uh, different parts of China, but also different parts of Global South that get to exchange on these, these topics a lot. But I think it's one of the stories that gets most misrepresented, I would say. Cool, thank you. So what kind of research do you do and why? You know, what you're there, you're doing research. Um, fill us in. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as you mentioned, you know, I, I'm with Tricontinental and I've been with the Institute uh, for the last five years since it was founded. And my main role is to um, work on art and culture. And that's interesting because I think uh, for anyone who's, you know, of the left, who are socialists, who are part of social movements and organizations, um, it's, I think it's, there's a kind of, sometimes a, we get cut off from our own history of struggles um, that came before us. And particularly what I'm interested in my research is kind of recovering the artistic and cultural work of, of different liberation struggles, especially of the global South from Cuba to Indonesia, to China, to elsewhere, and trying to connect that back into uh, our present struggles, kind of feed our present struggles. So um, I would say that's a big part of my work because I really do feel like as a socialist that in order for us to build socialism, it's also part of the battle of ideas, the battle over our emotions, you know, the battle to, create or become more human human beings um, that is impossible under capitalism. And then I, uh, another part of my research, and I think it's very linked, you know, um, given that I do live in a, a socialist country and, and part of it in these conversations is to try to explain or be a little bit of a bridge of what the project of socialism has been like in China. Um, and part of that is just providing news, as you mentioned, and thanks for giving a plug to the Dongshan uh, work because a few of us researchers, some from here, but some from other parts of the world, from you know Zambia, South Africa, Argentina, Brazil, we kind of came together and said we need information, you know, and that it doesn't have to be even, you know, you don't even need to want to be a socialist or believe in socialism. It's just you need information. I think it does a great disservice to the world if we think that a country of this size, uh, developing in this speed and of this you know length of history, doesn't have anything to offer. Uh, doesn't have anything that we can learn from and that we can sort of uh, one fell swoop, just think that it's, it's um, you know, the China bad narrative or something like that. So it's just to provide 
uh, some facts, information, and then also now opening up to other kinds of projects like we have a podcast that's hosted by these great, two great friends, Mika and Madeus, about the China Africa experience um, based from a South African and Zambian perspective. Um, we're trying to also bring what we call the Chinese voices, you know, some of the intellectual debates and the public debates that come in China because there's a sort of thinking that, you know, there's no debates in one in a country of 1.4 billion people, but there is a lot. And we want to bring a little bit of those perspectives, whether or not, you know, I personally will agree with the views. I think it's important that we have, you know, that kind of uh, nuance and, and, and like possibility for those who are interested to learn a little bit more. And everyone can access those at Dongsheng News, right? Both the crane and the, um, yeah. And, the places. So, and we're all on the social media platforms. So if you search Dongsheng News, you'll you'll find us. Cool. Well, I just want to, you know, take that a little further. You people in the West often portray China as an oppressive dictatorship without democracy or human rights. Um, how do you speak to that? You know, I think I know that, I mean, of course, I'm someone who believes in human rights and in humanity and people's lives over profit. And I would say, if you ask any Chinese person here, um, they will probably say they believe they live in a country that 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 supports just that. Uh, but sometimes I think the whole human rights narrative in a liberal sense gets kind of weaponized against people. And that seems really bizarre, right? And I feel that very strongly um, being Chinese and being here, how human rights is kind of used against us in some weird way to save us. Um, I look at one thing, you know, I, I think, um, especially doing research around the poverty campaign, it helped kind of help me understand what democracies and what human rights is in a much more expansive and I think much deeper way than just go to the ballot boxes every four years to choose, um, you know, a president or prime minister or what have you. We know the corruption of that system as well. Um, but one of the things is, um, you know, in China, let's say democracy, and I do believe there is democracy, just not electoral democracy. There's a democracy of a different form. When you go down to the grassroots level and had the privilege of being able to do that. And in fact, it, that film that Code Pink has been trying to get reinstated from um, about poverty, China's war on poverty, which I really encourage everyone to have a watch. It's still on CGTN on the China partner side. So please do watch it. You get to see on the grassroots level how democracy is actually practiced and enacted. Um, so for example, the kinds of um, uh, uh, democratic evaluation processes that happen to be able to ensure, to, to determine if someone is um, you know, registered as poor, if someone has been lifted out of poverty, if someone has returned out of poverty, it's a very collective process that, for example, all the villagers and all the local officials, but plus the party members are involved in. It's a collective process of, of, of debate and dialogue and oftentimes voting. There's processes of direct voting at the local levels, which then those representatives elect their representatives above and et cetera, et cetera. And for a country of such a size, there's a very complex political mechanism of, of uh, getting uh, uh, information, getting responses from the bottom all the way to the top. And, and, and it's, it's a machinery that is fascinating to learn more about. And I'm not claiming to be an expert on that, but those processes exist. Um, I think another thing in terms of human rights, I, you know, I, I think it was quite shocking looking back at the last three years of the pandemic. Um, one thing that happened is that for the first time in history, um, China's life expectancy actually surpassed that of the US. I mean, US, of course, China is the second largest economy, but it's still a de developing country. Uh, the US, um, because well, in large part because of the huge amount of deaths, uh, I think recorded now is 1.1 million people in COVID that could have been avoided uh, for a country of that size and, and wealth, uh, but didn't, right? Um, and that actually caused a decline, one of the highest declines since I've seen since, you know, people are comparing to World War, World War II to, you know, um, uh, the 1920s or, you know, it's a shocking numbers. Um, but when we look back historically, you know, when the PRC, People's Republic of China, was founded in 1949, the life expectancy was 36 years old. 
it was that helps you understand sort of the the poverty of the country, the situation of the country, and how weak the country was when it founded. In the U.S., it was already sixty eight, so it already arrived at such a high level of 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 development, and 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 I think. Um, why am I talking about um, the life expectancy? Because it accumulates a lot of things. You know, uh, it's about um, education. It's about uh, access to, uh, to healthcare. It's about you know questions of gender. Many things are embedded in the question of, of life expectancy. So that's just to say, in the last eight decades, the average Chinese person has more than doubled their lifespan, and this is in living memory. While the average person in the U.S. has gained one year of their life per decade. That's, you know, that says a lot when people, when you ask um, a Chinese person to say, oh no, you're you're really being oppressed. Your life is terrible. We need to save you. They're saying we're living some of the best lives we've ever lived. And they see it in their material lives. They see the improvements. They see the infrastructure. They see the, the, the lifting out of poverty. They see people getting into universities and the uh, education system improving. They see healthcare improving. And you can't convince them that they don't live in a society that cares about people and don't live in a society that doesn't have human rights. It's just not possible. Thank you. I mean, uh, a way we'll put it in the chat, but you know, bringing up that movie again, we, we actually have the one not on CGN, we have the original that was um, censored and we're asking people to show it to their communities. So way will put that in the chat because I think what you just said is all in that movie about, they, it's not about money, it's about creating a whole infrastructure that supports life. And, and that's basically the answer to how did they lift people out of poverty? And I forgot it's the five and the three or the two or like whatever the thing that you did on your last conversation, which I think we should put in the chat also way of the last conversation we had with Tings because I do think it's interesting about how you address something both with a plan but also with humanity and both were present and that there's lots of opportunities for everybody listening to go there and learn that. But Tings, what you were saying is that it's like, yes, you know, there's a life expectancy in the United States, but also if you are poor or a person of color in the United States, your life expectancies in the, you know, low sixties. So it's also gone backwards in a way. And in the South, I think there's a eight, year difference of life expectancy from a red state to a blue state. Mm. So that very much that taking out of poverty and the democratic process that is, the commitment to life that that is, is why I think it's censored because it's it's it could change life in the United States and it is changing life in China. And I think that's in this effort right now to humanize China, I think that is a really core piece of this conversation is what does a socialist government do? It serves the people. What does a capitalist government do? It serves capital and, the, and capital is the destructive, extractive, um, oppressive economy. <laughs> so uh, thank you for um, illuminating that. Um, I just, one more question, um, because you talked about the work you do and the research you do as about culture. Um, where now, besides Dongsheng News, uh, could people learn about popular culture in China? What movies to watch? You know, what are the big issues? I mean, I guess we can see that at Dongsheng News, but where, where do we be able to tap into Chinese culture if we can't go? Yeah, well, the borders are opening now, so hopefully people have a chance to see for themselves and, and also get a chance to know China, you know? Um, but that aside, there are lots of things to learn more about China that isn't on Netflix. Um, but, uh, well, one of the things um, to maintain the keep with the Dongshan plug is there's always a section on in the digests on people's life and culture. And so we try to bring more of those social stories and also some, some trends. Um, so you can kind of stay tuned for that. That section every week, there's definitely a couple things that's interesting culturally. Um, it's really impressive also, I think, being here is to see how much, you know, the film industry and the production quality has really improved. Uh, and to the point where I think people here are actually maybe in one of the only countries in the world where um, Hollywood films are kind of tanking now, you know, because people are preferring to see Chinese films. 
Um, lots of amazing series. Uh, depends on what you like, because what I like might not be what your audience likes. But I'll, I'll suggest two TV series um, that are online. You can find them on YouTube and you can find them with English subtitles uh, that were really popular in the last couple of years. One is called Minning Town, um, since I really do like stories about the countryside. Um, it's about uh, poverty alleviation um, and the kind of struggles in a town, in a, in a village. Um, and it's about, you know, the women in the period, especially in the early days of opening up reform, the women going into the cities to work in factories, and then also trying to create like a local economy um, based on uh, a different kinds of farming. And in this case was our mushroom farming and all the difficulties of having, you know, to negotiate between um, you know, party members and how to they serve the local population and then all sorts of things. Beautiful, I think is a really beautiful series. Uh, and another one who is, I think it's recommended for those who want to learn more about sort of socialists and Marxist history um, is called The Age of Awakening. It's about the kind of 1910s, 20s and when Marxist ideas were coming into the country and the kind of pre-formation of the party. Uh, also amazing, very historical, uh, 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 historically dense, but you know, for, for kind of history nerds like me, that's a fun one. Um, there's also some great films. I mean, I haven't been, I haven't sadly haven't been to the theaters in a few months, but the last one I watched, there's a lot of great comedies. Um, there's one called Moon Man that was quite big this last year. Um, it's like a science fiction comedy. Um, Basically, long story short, is that there's a maintenance worker on the moon station uh, left behind when they had to all evacuate because an asteroid was about to hit. Uh, but he was too, he's a bit of a, you know, funny guy, wasn't really paying attention to the alerts, was busy dancing, whatever. And he gets left behind with a kangaroo on the moon. And so it's that kind of humor, but great. Um, and then I'll mention one more movie, which I really loved. I think it was from two years ago. And I think this says something uh, broader culturally in terms of the themes. I think you mentioned like what kind of are the topics. So this film was called High Mob and it really took the country by storm. It's a uh, well, first time um, woman director. She's, she's, um, uh, she's a comedian. Um, she directed this film and it's a kind of semi-autobiographical. Uh, it's about her story um, uh, when her mom passed away suddenly in a car accident. It was like a, she goes back in time and meets the younger version of her mom who was working in a factory at the time and they become friends. You know, she travels back in time and gets to sort of learn about her life and, you know, see her moms in a different way. And that was, you know, that's interesting to think it wasn't films about war or end of the world or anything. It was actually a film about like mother daughter, a relationship. Um, and it was such a huge social hit because people started posting online photos of their moms in the eighties and like writing lots of appreciation notes of saying, oh, you know, how you were so beautiful or things sometimes like you shouldn't have married him. You know, <laughs> those are the kinds of things. And that was the biggest hit of the year. And she has now, um, this director is now the biggest grossing woman director, all time film history in the world. So these kinds of things that happen that I'm like, this is, this says something about the mood, I guess, or the, the spirit of the society, right? Uh, it's definitely a, not a warmongering and a very much, you know, a pro peace, let's say, kind of message. Well, that says a lot about the humanizing that's happening, you know, in China, which is not how we see them. So shame on the United States for seeing it in such a different way. Um, Mark asks, do Chinese people feel threatened by the belligerent rhetoric from the U.S. government and media towards China? Okay, I mean, that's a good question. Um, this last three years has been tough because as much as the pandemic was hard for everyone, then I think the U.S. really increased its attacks and, and, uh, and sort of assaults against China in various ways. So kind of hit them while they're down type of mentality I think the US has. I, one thing I think is important to note that most Chinese people, as much as it's not about a question of censorship or not, or having access to the West is that they don't actually read a lot of the Western media. I mean, not only do they not speak English, they don't look for it. It's just, you know, the US is not the center of the world of an average Chinese person. And unfortunately, I think for a lot of people in the US, it's hard to like 
recognize that most of the world doesn't think about them all the time. But um, that being said, yeah, I mean, there was, it was a really, I think, I think when the moment of Nancy Pelosi kind of defining all international norms decided to land in, in Taipei, that was a shock. And that was, that hurt a lot of people in the sense of that's a direct violation of the one China principle. And, and for Chinese people, there's nothing more dear than the question of, you know, uh, national unification or, or addressing this history of, of imperialism that is a history that's still ongoing as we see what's happening in Taiwan and the aggressions that are happening, the provocations that are happening. Um, in terms of is there a fear? Um, I'm not sure if there's a fear. Surely is an anti-war sentence people don't want. I mean, China has doesn't have the track record that the US has in terms of militarism, in, in terms of um, warmongering. It just isn't a country, even for, you know, before it was the PRC, that was the case. So um, there is no appetite to go and start a war because that's just not also in the nature. Um, so anything we can do, I think we have to, I think that's why the work of Code Pink is so essential, is to continue to forward an anti-war um, message that's essential for humanity. Um, Donald asks, are there homeless people in China? And um, are there a lot of single mothers who are dependent on government help? Um, I actually don't know the numbers on this, um, to, uh, to be honest about it. Um, I would say for one of the surprises, um, absolutely, my experience has been living um, in Shanghai and Beijing, but also going to some of the other smaller cities. Almost you will not see any homeless people, um, almost none. And I think it's something that um, um, is quite surprising for anyone who, especially I think, whether it's a global north or global south, you know, um, the rise in homelessness, uh, the rise in poverty, the reverse reversal back into poverty, especially of the last few years, worsened by the pandemic. Of course, the pandemic doesn't cause those root causes of poverty, but um, it has definitely worsened. It's nothing like that here. You won't see that. In terms of a uh, single women um, relying on the government, there are subsidies and there are sort of changing rules around who can access the kind of uh, benefits, uh, including um, um, non-married uh, single parents. So that is happening. I don't actually have the numbers of how many people rely on those though, but they do exist. Cool, thank you. Um, uh, <laughs> Kim has a question. Um, how prevalent is kissing or is it just for popularization of movies? <laughs> yeah, I would say, you know, you do see sometimes, you know, in a in an alley outside a bar, some young people might kiss, but it is not a culture where, um, I mean, I lived in Brazil before that. I would say there's a big difference about public displays of affection, let's call it, than here. That is true. You know, it is still a pretty, I think um, there's a kind of, uh, I don't know, it's a kind of the conservatism around showing that much affection on the streets. Like people will hold hands, people will be very much that, but you don't see a lot of people just making out on subways or something. <laughs> um, what also, how do, uh, Wei asked, how do um, Chinese people react when they see someone who's foreign? Um, and is there a difference between tier one cities and other places in, in their reaction? Um, I just want to answer that. I want to quickly say something. For me. Yeah, you've been in China, so you know. <laughs> uh, but I, I even, um, you know, my husband's Sri Lankan, Jamaican, you know, not Chinese. <laughs> He's a very much the other, um, not, you know, so not even white. Um, and he was coming back from Hong Kong. And I remember the thing he said to me, he had to go into quarantine. He said that everyone took care of him, that there were a hundred people on the plane and everyone made sure he was okay. And I thought about it and I thought if there was one Chinese person on a plane and Americans were going into quarantine, would they have done the same thing? Um, especially given how the culture is moving towards hate towards Asians. And I just thought, you know, so that that's my answer to that story. What's yours, Tings? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, my my partner um, is is Brazilian um, and not white. And um, when when we first moved to Shanghai, we we moved quite far out of the sort of downtown core where there's a lot of people who are from you know around the world. 
uh, visibly as well. Uh, we lived in a community where for sure he was the only person who was non-Chinese. And I would say I was also surprised with how how normalized, I guess, people were just, they were just nice and treated and maybe minimal kind of curiosity, like there's nothing at kind of the rudeness stop and point, look, there's a foreigner type of thing. It's very different. Obviously, these are still big cities. People are kind of used to it and just not um, not the same. I think it would look very different if you went to a small village. Even when when we went to my my grandfather's village, um, which is not that small and it's it's much quite developed now and has changed a lot in 30 years. Um, I'm sure some of the kids will be like, oh, curious, you know, you don't look like you're from around here. But on the whole, I think there's a warmness um, um, at most curiosity, but really not that much. Um, but there's a warmness. And, and usually what I have found, and I've heard from lots of friends who are not Chinese, it's almost like a uh, it can feel overbearing in the sense of like, really want to make sure, have you eaten? Do you need anything? Do you know how to get from a point A to point B? Maybe like too helpfulness, you know? <laughs> like, no, 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 I live here. I know how to get around. <laughs> um, so Donald asks, is there a lot of alcoholism or hard drug abuse in China? Drugs um, are really strictly controlled here. Um, and there is a historical reason for it, that kind of low, very kind of zero tolerance on drugs, you know, like marijuana is not seen as much worse than cocaine or, you know, so, and it's drugs are heavily controlled and not uh, a common thing. But I would say, even if you talk to most young people, um, there is a strong anti-drug sentiment. And that comes from this history of imperialism, of course, during the century of humiliation, what really began that period was the opium wars uh, led by the British. And it was a, an aggressive forcing upon us of opium um, and, and what that did to um, the economy, to the people, to the culture. And so that's in living memory of that kind of humiliation that was suffered. Uh, and, and the use of drugs as a tool, weaponized as a tool of, of basically accessing Chinese markets and exploiting um, uh, Chinese people. So that has created that. So drugs is not a major thing in the cultures, he, culture here, and it's very, very strictly controlled, and it's, it's not a joke. Um, alcohol is something that um, I think it's probably like in, in any society, um, I don't know much about in terms of, you know, how serious, how to compare alcoholism versus other places. Um, but surely there is going to be alcoholism here, um, like in any place. Like any other country, the same as you said about, you know, being a woman and patriarchy, it's, it's global. Um, uh, Dylan says you've lived in both Canada and China. Is there anything you like better about Canada than China? Well, definitely not the cold. Uh, I don't miss that at all, even though I've now Beijing is pretty cold and I was a little resentful to have to live where I have to buy a winter jacket again. Um, I guess what I do miss is, um, especially in Toronto and in the sort of around the greater Toronto area, it's a place that is, I think now probably ha more than half the people are born outside of Canada. And, and largely from the global south. So there's a dynamism and, and a kind of uh, culture that I love. I do miss being able to um, have friends and community from all parts of the world. And I do, I mean, this might sound trite, but maybe the food is what I miss. <laughs> I get to eat all the Chinese food I want here, which is great, but I don't get to eat all the whatever food that I'd like to eat of the same quality as I can get in Toronto, that's for sure. <laughs> So um, one last question, um, uh, and I think this, John, sorry, I don't, I'm not sure this is appropriate for Ting's because it's a political question about, uh, you know, China's aggressive policy regarding islands that have been considered Vietnamese. And I, I, I she's not, I don't, I don't think that's a, a Ting's question. Um, I know Ting's I am not following time. well to comment on it. Yeah. <laughs> I think Tings does spend time on an island um, in southern China that uh, she loves. <laughs> you want to say anything about Sonia and your escaping to Sonia and what that's sure. like? Yeah, Sonia is a city, um, very touristic city. Um, it's the beach town in the province island of Hainan, which is the southernmost part of China. 
Um, it's, I mean, who who doesn't want to spend some time on a beach, you know? Well, I know some people who don't, but I, I love it. So when there's a chance to go down there, I really do try to. Um, it also has a really lovely, I think, you know, socialist history that I think since we talked a lot about women and everything that I love, uh, which is around, it's called the Red Detachment of Women. And it's a, based on a historical, um, uh, basically brigade, a women's brigade uh, that was, uh, you know, fighting against feudalism, fighting uh, against the nationalists, fighting against Japanese occupation. And so it was a, a brigade of about 120 women um, that were there, guerrilla fighters in the jungles of Hainan. And that has really become a living legacy uh, culturally um, throughout the you know, last hundred years, uh, whether it's um, you know, ballets, plays, films. And now there's a production, I think Jody, you've been there before to see like this massive uh, production that's on every night where there's like 500 actors moving stages. And it's a beautiful homage to, to that history that it's a reminder for especially young younger generations of that living history you know so that's one of the reasons also I love of love Sonia well the first time I went one of the women was in a wheelchair I think she was 98 or something um I yeah don't know exactly alive but yeah quite amazing to keep that spirit that revolutionary spirit alive about those women that would not accept the violence of their of the landowners so mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, Tings, thank you so much for letting us see China through your eyes and letting us ask you some questions. Thanks for all you do. Um, ways put a lot of ways to engage in the um, in the campaign. This campaign is about China is not our enemy, and there's so many tools for you to be a tuning fork for peace. To to invite people to the Dongsheng News. To invite people to some of the studies that. Things has done done for the tricontinental research um, that there there is information out there that helps us humanize ourselves and humanize uh, China in in our eyes. So deepest gratitude. Please, everyone, be engaged. We can see it's it's up again. The you know Washington is a buzz with we're going after China today. They just said you know the Republicans. The one thing Republicans and Democrats agree on is the war on China. So, you know, we have work to do. We know wars are not the answer. We know we need cooperation for people and the planet. And uh, thanks, Tings, for keeping us informed in all the ways you do. And I encourage you to please read Tings' piece on COVID um, because that's one of the places where the mass of lies is happening. And she really takes us in a deep dive um, in that piece. And there's one piece that came out of the China's Not Our Enemy team asking a question. And I, um, after they read it, and that was, well, how did, why did it change so quickly? Why did the pivot happen so quickly? And I think you've just added that. Um, if you could answer that question, because I think it's fascinating about, you know, it, it was gonna maybe, they were gonna, you know, after the Congress, they were gonna unroll it over a few months and then they swept, flipped. What, what, what was that flip? I guess in a way, um... As I was mentioning back um, with the uh, Shanghai, um, recognizing that lockdown period was already a period of, okay, this virus is changing. Um, it's both more transmissible and less deadly. So there was already a process that was happening over the last months. And so um, back in November, uh, early uh, November 11th was the first time the central government already began relaxing measures. Um, it was the 20 measures of various things around quarantine rules, no more use of lockdowns, et cetera, et cetera. And that period was a transition, some confusion, in, especially in local areas of how to implement it. And then later on in December was another, the, the more big announcement, I guess, of you know, January 8th, the, um, the travel restrictions are gonna be lifted, uh, PCR testing, uh, mass testing was lifted and, and the variety of things that we saw as the kind of quick um, quick change. But I guess I want to put it in a context of a, it's been a few months, it's kind of been a few months process. There's no way of sort of half opening the border or half doing COVID zero. The virus comes and it comes and it was already spreading quite quickly. So that was, I think it was some, one of the ways it was this very quick rollout and, and, and infections were grew and everything like that. But it was already in a couple of months of, okay, let's relax a little bit. And then we just 
they opened up the border. Um, now in many cities already, the cases are, are already on their decline. Um, of course, in winter, it complicates things because it's colder, especially in the north where um, it's usually people have other, you know, winter related illnesses. So this is it's a difficult moment and it's in a transition. Um, there's also quite a lot of, I think, relief, you know, we're, we're about to enter the, you know, Chinese New Year, the Lunar New Year, which starts in nine days. Um, people are excited to, you know, see their families, travel and return back to relatively normal life. So there's also optimism about the future. Can you say something about Spring Festival? I'm sorry to keep you so late. Do you have to be somewhere? No, no, no. Oh, um, because I think it would be interesting for, the, for everyone to understand about Spring Festival. You kind of brought it up about the new year. But, um, you know, we have Thanksgiving or Christmas where people go see their families and in China it's Spring Festival. If there's anything you can tell us about that. Yeah, um, sure. How to happen, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is the most important holiday of the year. You know, there's four big holidays um, around the seasonal changes, but Spring Festival is by far the biggest. And it, it's always a shock, you know, I remember, I, I know every year the media goes like, wow, this is the single largest migration of human history that happens every year, because that's the time where, you know, there are literally billions of trips being made, you know, there and back uh, for people to go visit their hometown. And so it's a week long festival. And usually it's people just go home, you know, a lot of people who live in different cities, this is their chance that they can reunite with the family, eat eat a lot, always food. Um, and so that's, this is what um, we're expecting uh, a large amount of people to be traveling this year to go see family, probably still not at the sort of pre-pandemic levels um, with, you know, people traveling with caution, especially those who are um, elderly and et cetera. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a pretty exciting moment this year. It's happening a bit earlier because it's on the lunar, lunar calendar. So it doesn't fall uh, uh, on the same day every year in the Gregorian calendar. So we just had the, the kind of Gregorian New Year, January 1st, and then very three weeks later, we have the other one. So January is a, a, a double celebration this year. Cool. I, but the whole idea of a billion people moving to go home is quite staggering. Yeah. And, and how, I think it's important to say how long it lasts. It's a week, is it a week? Yeah, it's a week. I mean, you know, we get four days here and three days there, you know, to really grab grapple with having a week that you get to take off that is what the whole country is doing. When you think about just the two days that people take off around Thanksgiving or New Year's and what that feels like, even in the quietness and the stillness and the not working, it's quite a powerful time. Yeah, well, one of the things though with the with the holidays here, um, sadly, oftentimes we have to make up for a Saturday following or a Sunday following, so. But we get the full week off, so that's that's the nice thing. You just might have to make up a couple of the days later. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know. Thank you. <laughs> all right, Tings, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thanks for all you do to make us smarter and more human and more related. Thanks to all of you who joined for your care and your concern and your wanting that you know, you're lifting up that China is not our enemy. May we continue to do this work, much needed. Uh, we do not need another war. Uh, all of you could be engaged with us. Uh, International Women's Day, we are calling for a global movement to say no war, diplomacy, cooperation is what we need and it applies both to Ukraine and to China. So please uh, reach out to Wei, get engaged. Uh, Tings, maybe you'll like do something out of, out of China. We can have it be part of, our, part of our global call. We want 50 countries, that would be cool. Absolutely. Let's think All about it. All right, that. everyone. Onward to peace. Thank you so much. And thank you to Wei and Maha for making this all work. Thank <laughs> you for the hard work. Thank you for having me. And thanks to everyone who stayed on the call. Bye.